What are you doing? Welcome to uh, another edition and the first ever edition of Behind the Mask with Dr. Mark Patterson, a very well-regarded and renowned pediatrician in the sleep disorder community. Uh, not only is Dr. Patterson a, uh, a pediatrician, but he's also the father of a, of a one-of-a-kind daughter that is an amazing uh, narcolepsy patient advocate. Um, and we thought it'd be important to have Dr. Patterson here today. Not only is he on the front lines in his community, uh, but also hearing from uh, fellow narcolepsy uh, members and families and caregivers uh, in, in regards to uh, their issues dealing with this COVID crisis and how it's impacting their access to their medication and their family life and their quality of life. And, and one of the other things I really want to cover in here is, you know, narcolepsy patients are really some of the best at teaching people how to manage and schedule their sleep, especially in this new sort of confinement that we in society are all starting to go through. Uh, that's that's a, an abnormal issue for most people, but for sleep apnea patients and chronic fatigue and uh, idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy and all the other different levels and variations of this, uh, you know, we're used to being home and uh, we could actually be a leader in this regard uh, so we can help, you know, our fellow public uh, stay healthy and therefore not uh, compromise themselves, their families or any of us. Uh, the other person I have on the call today is our chief strategy officer, Jills Friedman, uh, the founder of ACOR and a co-founder of Smart Patients, uh, who's been a, a fellow sleep apnea patient and has been a, a role model and a mentor in helping us uh, bridge uh, our growth as a patient advocacy association in the American Sleep Apnea Association, sleepapnea.org. Uh, Jill's is, uh, I think, would be a really good, helpful person for us to call on, Mark, uh, throughout this call in regards to how we bridge the sleep disorder communities and how we come together and we start to break the silos. The other person we have on our call is Teresa Schumard, who's uh, been in the sleep field for a long time, and she's an ASA board member, and most importantly, she's Mother T, and she's our community leader, and she's on the front lines right now fielding questions, whether it's our inbox or social media, and to be able to talk to a pediatrician um, who's on the front lines, who has a daughter that has a, a rare disease, a, a sleep disorder, is it's just invaluable to us. So I can't thank you enough. Uh, I will hand the, the mic to you. and. Um, you can introduce yourself, and, and if, if you don't mind just sort of telling us uh, your background here, that would be great. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, my name is Mark Patterson. I'm a general pediatrician in Roanoke, Virginia, the Southwest Virginia area. I've been a pediatrician for about 30 years. Um, before that, I actually was, was in biochemistry, a PhD in biochemistry, did that for about four years in industry before I decided to go back into medicine. So I've been in general pediatrics for, for 30 years. Uh, like Adam said, you know, I have a daughter who's an adult now who has narcolepsy and cataplexy. She was diagnosed about 16 years ago. And because of that, as a pediatrician, narcolepsy is a, is a pediatric condition. Most pediatricians don't know much about it. So I actually had to have a sleep learning curve when she was diagnosed to try and figure out best treatment options, what to do for her and her lifestyle. Obviously, you know, sleep disorders affect everyone, not just the patient themselves. And so you, I got involved in narcolepsy issues at that time. I was involved with the national organization for a number of years um, until last year when things got too busy and I was dropped off. I do now have my own little uh, nonprofit called dayfornaps.org. That's a, um, a digital platform for all things narcolepsy going on globally. So it's a great resource for people with narcolepsy conditions. But, but because of my issues with narcolepsy, you know, it, it's... It's such an um, all-encompassing uh, condition like any sort of chronic condition. You have to learn a lot of things about it. That's how I got interested in the first place. What were some of the first things that, that your, your child started showing or, or you know, as, as from your experience as a pediatrician that, you said, oh, wait a second, this might be something else than, than the normal. If you can sort of walk us through that, that would sort of be a, helpful, I think, for us to understand as one as parents of apnea patients. but. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that have overlapping, whether it's sleep disorder, breathing, and cataplexy, or what, whatever comp, fun little combination you get blessed with. Right. So. And that's, that's the hard part is that your narcolepsy typically has its onset during adolescent years. And that's when kids are going through, you know, sleep changes. They tend to stay up later, you know, sleep, you know, later in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, they tend to have a lot of distractions. Taking, you know, at that time wasn't quite as much of an issue with all the electronic devices. 
that keep kids awake. So you don't poor sleep hygiene. It's such an issue. Right. We were about substance abuse. And she was about, you know, 12, 13 when it became manifest on her. And the big thing we noticed was just the, the excessive daytime sleepiness. She just falls asleep at the drop of a hat. My wife knows it more because when she pick her up from friends or from activities, she falls asleep in the car, even though friends are in the car. Mm-hmm. When we take on a trip, she'd fall asleep. Uh, we'd be at, you know, we were going to a medical conference and she had a resort. We were waiting for dinner and she had to get up and wander around. And fortunately, she fell asleep in the bathroom stalls. We didn't know where the resort she was. So obviously, panic ensues. The big thing that she expressed, which we didn't really visualize for a while, was a turn out to cataplexy, which you have brief moments of um, loss of muscle tone. And she got to where she was very scared about walking up and down the stairs because she was afraid she was going to have episodes of it. And there were times well, where... Can you, can you sort of explain for our community? Because I know it's a cataplexy is a common thing for, for you and, and, and your folks. Uh, sort of the what cataplexy is what a full narcoleptic attack is maybe some of that you know just an english layman's how you were to explain it to a to a child you know mm-hmm. what the difference is and what maybe what your daughter's trigger was you were saying the steps and the stairs you know is right. it is it excited is it laugh or is it cardiac what really gets her going well most most people with, with uh, narcolepsy and cataplexy you describe some strong emotion usually laughter because she had a very good sense of humor so when she laughed at things Strong emotions, other can, like if you're startled or scared, uh, if you're angry about things, you can. And she always uses the definition or the example of kind of like a marionette or a puppet that the strings are cut on. And that you just so, suddenly lose, you know, all muscle tone. And you can have very subtle things where you have kind of a head drop or your, your eyes. And kids, you get kind of this funny tongue thrusting where you do things. But most people describe it sort of, you know, full body collapse. And it's different than a seizure because a lot of times people will think you're having a seizure. But in cataplexy, they're fully awake and they're fully aware of what's going on. And it can last for a few seconds. It can last for a few minutes. And, you know, usually they'll have some brief time to catch themselves. It'll, it'll take a second or two. So they can kind of reposition themselves. They don't get hurt too badly. But there are a lot of reports of people getting severely injured when they fall and hurt themselves. And how would you say a cataplexy attack is different than a, a so-called microsleep that a lot of us sleep apnea patients are having all day long right. that we don't even realize it sitting at a stop sign or, you know, right. that nod. Yeah. You know, microsleep is kind of like the name implies that you have just a very brief episode of sleeping. Right. And what's hap- what's hard for the, the adolescents, the school age kids or people in work is that they are not aware they're asleep. They kind of just, they'll open their eyes and not realize you can sleep for, you know, two seconds, five seconds, 10 seconds, or you have this automatic behavior. Like when you're driving, and you don't we don't know how you got to where you are you kind of realize that you're a few miles down the road right. and if you really thought about what you saw in route you don't really remember that and you have those little micro sleep episodes which obviously is very dangerous and, and concerning but that's a little bit different than the cataplex cataplex you are still fully awake and aware of things going on around you and does every cataplexy episode have a sleep paralysis component to it it, not so much sleep paralysis, more just the muscle tone loss. Right. The kind of, you have, you know, the weakness and, and, and all that. And, and the problem is that, you know, the, the, you can get confused because if you have some, see someone suddenly collapse, you obviously think they're having a, a heart attack or a seizure or a stroke or something like that. And, and unfortunately, the medical community is not real aware of it. And so they can result in interventions that are necessary for someone with cataplexy actually make the situation worse at times. Do, do most narcolepsy patients have some sort of band or some sort of pin on or symbol for the people that, that might know uh, if they were having an attack, if they're not, their friends aren't around or people that aren't aware of this? You know, sadly, probably not as many you know, as should. Um, it's good for anyone with any chronic medical condition, be it you know, sleep apnea or um, any sort of you know, narcolepsy and cataplexy to have some sort of awareness thing just so people have be aware. Sadly, because, you know, obviously, you know, sleep apnea is fairly well understood in the medical community, but narcolepsy and cataplex is really not. So we've got lots of reports when I was involved with the um, narcolepsy network where patients would go to the ER and be seen and they look at the brace and say you have narcolepsy and cataplexy. But the ER physician had no idea what it was. And so that was helpful, but not really. 
because they really didn't know how to intervene to, to, to assist the patient. But it definitely recommends for anyone with any chronic medical condition to have some sort of awareness um, ban on you. There are some people that you can buy these devices that basically they're like little pin drives. They have, you know, the USB port you can plug into the, to the uh, computer. And while in theory that's nice because you can put all, more medical information on there, but in reality, being in the medical community, no one's going to plug an unknown pin drive into a computer system because if, if there's a virus on there, it's going to corrupt and infect the entire system. And so even though in theory it's a good idea, it's not going to be used in the medical community, to be honest. So it's better to have something writing, either a card or bracelet or a necklace or something like that. Right. And, and I think Apple and then the phones are starting to work on some sort of access or who has the emergency contact. I know uh, Jills has a question here, so I'm going to call on Jills. See if I yes. can un unmute Hello, Dr. Patterson. This is Jill Friedman. Uh, yes. Follow up on the cataplexy. Are there any treatments for it? There are. I mean, the, the, coincidentally, a lot of times people, when they're first diagnosed with narcolepsy and cataplexy, there's usually about a 10 year time lag in the diagnosis. So a lot of times people are diagnosed with depression first and they put on antidepressants. Antidepressants actually are, are effective in treating cataplexy. They don't do anything for the narcolepsy itself, but they, they help with the cataplexy attacks. And there's some new medications that are coming out now too that are proven to be effective both for the excessive excessive daytime sleepiness and for the cataplexy. Um, things like the one called Sinosi that's, that's become available just in the last uh, few months here in the U.S. Uh, the one called uh, sodium oxidate or Xyrem helps with sleep consolidation. I tell that can help with cataplexy as well. Um, but the, the antidepressants actually are the, the older ones that are still very effective to, to treat cataplexy. It's interesting you say that because one of the, the key factors for me getting compliant and getting my, my sleep management, my sleep apnea under control was not the CPAP, wasn't taking care of my allergies, wasn't anything else I was doing. It was uh, the, the Prozac that not for the depression, but for the anxiety, but that helped reprogram that sleep architecture overnight. And I've been on that over, over a decade mm -hmm. now, um, but I never knew it. You know, and I think I used to have cataplexy attacks when I was a kid because I fell asleep at the wheel. I came out of mm -hmm. cold water and, you know, I had to sit down and went, you know, Dr. Gimmett always said, no, you, you straight up at me. You don't have narcolepsy and cataplexy, but, you know, who knows? But, you know, exactly. <laughs> and that's the hard thing with cataplexy. There's not really a test you can do for it. I mean, sometimes sleep doctors will try and tell jokes and, and try and get the, the patient to laugh. But if you ask people with narcolepsy and cataplexy, it annoys the heck out of them when they do that. So really, they get more annoyed and mad than anything else. So there's, there are people that are trying to come up with some sort of, you know, uh, uh, objective test for cataplexy. And sadly, there's not really one that's been developed yet that's effective to test for. There's mainly more just for um, your clinical observation. So then they're, the, the cataplexies are just patient reported and outcomes. Yes. You know, so in fact, I was at a, a sleep conference two years ago, and it was a room full of about 200 people with narcolepsy or specialists with, for narcolepsy. And they asked him how many people actually witnessed cataplexy. Only about 10% of the people raised their hand. So even clinicians really don't know what it looks like. And the subtle cases where you have just the head drop or the, 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 you know, the eyes, you know, sort of cross, you know, that even the patients are unaware sometimes they're having it. And so the clinicians are very poor at picking those up. You know, some, some of the doctors like Michael Thorpe in New York, he says he can tell right away because he's been doing it for so long. But other, other physicians really don't know. I was going to tell you, I had a, an incident uh, years ago before I ever was diagnosed with sleep apnea with my, my general practitioner in San Francisco. And I was more worried about the early onset Alzheimer's and all the, all the, the spinal issues I was having and all the anxiety and hysteria because obviously I didn't know I was untreated for major sleep apnea in those days. And he literally did an uh, EKG in, in, in his office in my, my exam, and I had a vasovagal syncope right in front of him. And no one, I never would have been able to term it as a vasovagal syncope, but he saw me have it. He saw the sweat, and he, you know, and I, so then I got really conscious of it and, you know, knowing the feeling and that's the feeling and it comes on, be careful, sit down, you know, and it's just to this, it, it's interesting all these years later that the, 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 the warning signs were so abundant throughout my life, you know, that it's, I'm happy that we could have these conversations to teach our communities. Uh, Jill's has another question, so I, I definitely don't want to be hog the mic here because uh, I've had too much coffee today, it appears. <laughs> Can you have too much coffee? 
<laughs> so, Doctor, yes, uh, I have a couple of questions for you. I think yes, I need to do a little introduction so you understand where I'm coming from. Uh, I build uh, more than 250 online communities over the last 25 years for people suffering from cancer and other really serious conditions. And one of the things that I noticed in the many online communities for cancer that we built originally was that those communities were completely siloed because of the technology we were using at the beginning. And as a result, people in two or three different communities were not aware that the drug that was suddenly in clinical trials for their condition had already been in trials five, six years prior for a different type of cancer and that the community where you had the first clinical trial had a mountain of information regarding that drug. So it became clear to me that in the modern era of medicine, we have to work to try to take away all those silos. Now that I'm working with the Sleep Apnea Association, I noticed that sleep apnea is just one of maybe 50 like sleeping disorders. And I wonder if you as a pediatrician who sees lots of children with lots of conditions, I've uh, noticed the same thing, that although you diagnose children with various sleeping disorders, there may be lots of commonality between those disorders, commonalities and many differences too. Yeah, indeed, and that's, that's the problem with so many things is that as a pediatrician, you might, one of my big missions is to train my peers about things and teach them about things. Because, you know, unless a, a physician, regardless of what their specialty is, unless they think about a condition, they're not going to diagnose it. And, you know, as Adam had mentioned, you can have different conditions, you can present with different ways, and it's, for the, it's up to the physicians to not try and put the puzzle pieces together. And sometimes it fits very nicely, and sometimes you have no clue what it is. And that's what, what's hard part is you can have, you know, at least from the pediatric standpoint, you have children who have different conditions and there could be an overlap. Like, you know, we certainly will see kids with uh, obstructive sleep apnea in the population because of, you know, large tonsils or because of uh, large adenoids. Because in kids, it's usually more of, you know, as the name implies, obstructive. Luckily, in kids, it's usually an easy fix. You, you have the odor and cars, the ears, the throat doctors take them out, and then usually you open up their way and everything's fine after that. But some of that can, can cause problems as far as, you know, the, the, the kids. And, uh, and like I said, you know, a lot of times you have the circadian rhythm disorders in kids. You have kids, like I said, that you poor sleep hygiene. So it is hard to, to find a common, like I said, you know, common group or common website that tie, ties everything together. In fact, as a pediatrician, you know, I'm part of the American Academy of Pediatrics. And, you know, the meeting I went to last February down in Florida, that was for the sleep pulmonary section of the American Pediatrics. And I complained to them that there wasn't really much on sleep. And the thing that they, you know, agreed was that if you want to do that, you have to go to the actual sleep meetings, the one that's usually held every year with American Sleep Medicine. And so even with it, with our pediatric community, there's not a good base for understanding things, which is horribly frustrating because we don't want to have to join other membership organizations and try and learn about those things, whereas we want to do it in our own community. So even among the professional organizations, there's very bad, at least in my experience, you know, very, very poor um, group data as far as what to do things. It's not like you can plug in symptoms and have a diagnosis pop up. That'd be wonderful if there was some sort of database that was validated that you could do that sort of thing. Because it is, a lot of times there's not, you know, separate. Um, it's nice to have, you know, one problem, but as, you know, people in the narcolepsy and the the OS, the obstructive sleep apnea group know um, there is there is a commonality between the two because certainly people with narcolepsy can have apnea as well and vice versa. So it's not exclusive between the two, and the symptoms can be confusing, like Adam mentioned. So it's hard to know sometimes what's really what's really wrong with the the patient. So I, I have a lot of questions, but the the first one, and I think is is really the most important, and it really hits home on our long-term goal and mission here as, as, as parents and as, 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 a, as a father of someone with sleep apnea, knowing that we can get this early and, you know, whether it's the surgical intervention or, or you know, getting the, the, the proper education out to the, the dental and the orthodontist and the pediodontist and the allergist 
and you know making sure before that kid who presents as hyperactive is ever put on a on a, on a on an amphetamine of some sort that probably is not necessary. Um, so you know being able to get our communities, our chronic population, our rare populations in sleep in front of the American Academy of Pediatrics so we can start teaching these pediatricians because we can prevent a lot of these comorbidities and we know that. And, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a moneymaker for people. And we know our, 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 our system obviously being improved during this crisis as being overrun. And, and we're going to see the effects of fatigue and, and on, on decision making as the days go by. And we know it's going to get exponentially worse and uglier. And there'll be more mistakes made because of it, unfortunately. Right. Um, so, you know, the best thing we could tell our communities is stay at home, get your sleep, keep your immune system strong. Um, because, you know, our frontline doctors like you, uh, our pediatricians who are seeing these kids that are that are coming in asymptomatic, they're getting exposed one way or another. Uh, right. And we just don't know enough about this virus. And one thing we do know is if you stay home, uh, you're going to help us push out that window so that we can learn about it and, and treat the, 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 the emergency people who are having the, the respiratory issues that are that are coming through the door that need that need that emergency treatment. That aren't, you know, they're not just fearful because of what they're seeing on the news or the TV or reading about you know, I need to run out and have a test. That's, that's not the priority right now. Right now, the priority is stay at home, protect yourself, protect your family and protect your neighbors. Um, because this, this is a rapid spready, sticky, uh, little virus that we're just learning about, uh, around the globe and it doesn't discriminate. Um, and for our communities, especially with autoimmune issues and compromise, you know, staying healthy in this time, we have to be vigilant, uh, more than ever. Uh, but we also have to be the leaders for everyone else that doesn't know how to stay at home and doesn't know what it's like to be in bed all day uh, and explain to them how to manage that and how, you know, how you, how you don't go crazy being confined all day. Uh, cause you, cause you know, your biggest goal today was getting out of your bed and taking a shower for some of us. That's, that's a big achievement some days. Right. So, Adam, I have a follow up question yes. for Dr. Patterson. So since we, since it looks like there is really the, lots of commonalities as well as differences between all those conditions. And since everybody is right now stuck at home, I don't think you are going to have any kind of influence on the academy, like the various professional medical groups right now, because they are like, they're involved in something different. But how about like trying to organize an online conference with as many groups for sleep disorders as possible so that we can really re do a recording of what are the commonalities, what are the common concerns, as well as what are some of the differences. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, the sleep meetings that's held in June of every, every year. It was scheduled for the 13th, I believe, of June of this year in Philadelphia. And this one actually you know, does bring together organizations and groups and sleep people from all over the world um, to, to this meeting. And usually, it's very, when I first started going, there about 9,000 clinicians be there. Last time it was about five, 6,000. So it really brings together all the different different things, be it either, you know, sleep apnea or narcolepsy or circadian rhythm disorders. So they're trying to decide if they're going to hold it or not because of all the um, stay-at-home orders. Here in Virginia, they, they extended it yesterday or the other day to June 10th. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's going to impact the meeting they're going to have. And hopefully they will do, try and do an online kind of conference as a result of that. So I have no idea yet how they're going to pull it off because it's, like I said, they have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of speakers to come to these things. But if you're not familiar with it, I would certainly would check it out. That's probably the one organization or one meeting. It's two different uh, organizations that get together in this combined venue to, to present sleep things. And that's probably the best globally that I'm aware of. Um, that, that does it here, here to pull together exactly like you said, try and pull together all the different, you know, sleep organizations and, and topics in one, one venue. Cause it really is a great, great meeting. But thank you, doctor. But if I'm not mistaken, this is a meeting for healthcare professionals mostly. Primarily. I said, you know, you know, you don't have to be a physician, but if, you know, someone in the clinical field, as far as, you know, as far as one that's open to, to everyone, um, I'm not familiar with whether well, there, there is one that's going to be down and held in Australia. It's scheduled for Australia called Sleep Down Under. It's going to be in October. And that's one that does have both professional organizations and uh, patients involved, too. 
whether they're going to hold it or whether it's going to be a, a virtual event, I don't know. But unfortunately, I really don't know of many other ones that do it for all sleep issues. So the Narcolepsy Network uh, does a, an annual conference, usually in October, and it has, brings together both the clinicians and the, 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 the patients or the, or the caregivers. But it's they're, they're definitely for narcolepsy and or idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, those are the main topics. I, so, I, can, I can see here that uh, Teresa Schumard, our community leader, has a question for you, so I'm going to call on her. Hi, Dr. Patterson. I met your daughter at our FDA meeting. It was a pleasure mm -hmm. to get to know your organization. Could we ask, at what age uh, does narcolepsy start showing up for, uh, for children? And is it usually for children? And at what point is there possibly a crossover with obstructive sleep apnea or sleep apnea? Well, it usually has onset during the teenage years, the early adolescent years. And um, there's two types of narcolepsy. Type one is the classic one that has cataplexy or the loss of muscle tone associated with it. And that has been shown pretty, pretty convincingly to be an autoimmune disorder. What happens is that you have something, an illness that attacks part of the, the brain, the neurons that control or release chemical that controls the wake sleep cycle called hypocretin orexin. And because of that, you lose those, those cells. And so you, your sleep is just dysregulated. And usually things like after the influenza or strep or some other issues can, can trigger the, re, the response. Um, so usually, you know, the 10, 11, 12 is the most common age for it. We'll see kids as young as four and five that have it. Um, because of the delay in diagnosis, sometimes it can take up to 10 years to be diagnosed. Because like I mentioned, a lot of times they're misdiagnosed with uh, depression or anxiety or schizophrenia or something else before the, the real diagnosis is made. They can delay it by 10 years. So usually they're actually young adolescents before they get diagnosed. And said that, that's why pediatricians don't know much about it, because usually you're seeing adult medicine doctors by that time. And as far as the sleep apnea, I really haven't seen a lot of studies on that, I'm afraid. I, mean, I, I know that the kids who have you know, the, you know, the, the tonsillar adenoids you know, enlargement that can come out at many ages. A lot of times when people are younger, usually the five, six, seven year olds can, can see that. And so the teenage years, you can see it too. They give kids that they have, you know, a little excess weight in the throat area that can contribute to it as well. Um, but I honestly haven't seen many studies that look specifically at the ages of correlation between narcolepsy and or apnea. Thank are, are, you. You're welcome. Are you, are you seeing a lot of patients or, or, or so-called uh, sleep disorder breathing patients just in your area as a result of whether it's the childhood obesity or that tonsils and adenoids is not as frequent of, a, of an intervention as it was once was uh, generations ago. Um, I mean, these, these are the kind of questions I want to have that I want to design with right. the, the, the professionals in the sleep societies and whether the pulmonologists, the cardiovascular doctors, the mental health. Um, that's why, you know, we're doing these things. I can't wait for them to figure out that they have to go to a virtual meeting. If, if we wait for them, it'll be next year. Um, yeah. And so, you know, that's why I want to flip the model. I want to bring in, in the doctors that are willing to have a bi-directional conversation and, and, you know, and not scared to say, I don't know the answer or, hey, we need to learn or let's do this together. Um, right. So I think what Jill's is really trying to get at is, is we're, we're going to be doing these virtual conferences uh, online and we're doing it. We're set up for it and we're going to expand it, get better at it. Uh, but our, our communities are at home. They, they need the information. They need it translated. Um, and it's time that the science side, the academic side, that, 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 that you know, mysterious big giant HIPAA wall, which is there for the wrong reasons, is, is knocked down. Uh, because we know and you know that HIPAA is really about protecting portability, <laughs> not necessarily patient privacy. Most people chagrin, but that's another conversation and probably another panel that we could do at our patient meeting. <laughs> so, and it is hard because you know, like like you said, you know, things are becoming more virtual now because historically, I mean, I'm so old school that you know, I have sick patients that want to physically see them and examine them and talk to them, talk to the families. But in the last two weeks, we've definitely changed the model to where you need so much more telemedicine. And we're on the upslope and just learning curve of that. Um, in my office, you know, we're doing probably about you know, half a day on telemedicine business as best we can. So we need to bring the sick kids in once in a while. 
but it really sort of opened up the models. A lot of it, unfortunately, it comes down to insurance and I don't want to you know, pick on insurance companies, but you know, the, they're luckily one good thing that's come with this is that they're more willing to reimburse now for, for that because, you know, we have enjoyed doing the telemedicine visits and some specialties, I know, you know, our, my clinic, the, the psychiatrists are only doing telemedicine visits now because of the risk of, of contamination. And once the insurance companies realize that this is the, the new model and hopefully this will knock down the wall, then, um, you know, you know, if everyone can reimburse for it, then I think it'll definitely be the, the model of the future going forward where you just see those patients that you need to see. And from the patient standpoint, particularly the ones with sleep issues or they have problems getting out of the house or getting up and going or driving or commuting to, to the clinician's office, it's going to be a godsend for them to be able to just you know, sit at home, like what we're doing now, and talk to people and explain what's going on. So it really will change things dramatically. And, the, and these should be wellness visits. This is why you don't bring a, a, a healthy person into a, to a sick environment or an infected environment. I mean, just, you know, just helping clean up our hospitals, I think will be one of the positive ramifications that's coming out of this new world that we're living in uh, as far as flipping the model. Uh, yeah, you're a doctor, you're a pediatrician, you're a clinician, you need to use your hands, you need to smell, you need your eyes. Uh, but if, if, if that's not a necessity and it's not an emergency, it can be done. I've been doing telehealth, not telehealth, just phone health with, with my uh, psychotherapist from Stanford for years. And, you know, we check in every six weeks and, you know, we have a conversation and, and is it perfect? No, but, you know, we've had a relationship for 10 years. So he, know, he knows when, when to call me on my stuff, vice versa. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, it's, I, there's, listen, we're going to have to adapt. And, and you know, at, us as, as, as sleep patients that are, you know, been cast aside as, as sort of the, the secondary, not a, a serious disease because we're not cancer, we're not dementia, or, you, know, you know, we're this, this thing that you do while you're unconscious that, you know, it's, it's, it, this is the time, this crisis, unfortunately, that we're going to really be able to show how sleep is a component of everything that everyone's dealing with on a daily basis. Um, and as you, as you mentioned before, the kids are like the, the, the hyperactivity. And that's one of the things that, you know, you always have to ask about sleep issues because so many t- times kids are sleep deprived mm-hmm. and they lack in a hyperactive, inattentive kind of fashion. So it really is difficult to, to know because sleep is such an important part. And sadly, you know, it's been, you know, in social media, how little training you know, physicians get in sleep medicine. So it's only if you go in. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm being, I was joking. That's the dirty secret, right? <laughs> it's only if you go into sleep medicine and do a fellowship in it, absolutely. But most physicians, they've said, you know, you get maybe a day or two worth of training in because sleep is this big black box. So you see, you close your eyes and you become unconscious for a while and then you wake up and hopefully you're better. But we don't really know what happens when sleep goes on. You can study the brainwave activity, but as far as you know, the law of theories for, for the consolidation of memories or what goes on, we really don't know because it's, it's just, it happens in the dark and who knows what goes on. I, um, but that's I, the problem. I, I know Jules has a question, but, you know, I, I was just going to say, you know, I get a lot of uh, some, some of the – a lot of clinicians in the, in, in the field and in the public or on social media give me a lot, of, a lot of grief because, you know, they'll say, oh, you're bashing on doctors. I'm like, I don't bash on doctors. I'm just pointing out the flaws and the errors in the system. It's the, the, the providers, the patients, we're all flawed. And the only thing that's different is since we're not married to anyone and we're not confined to one intervention because of this chronic disease of ours that overlaps, you know, chronic the rare cradle to grave with everyone, that, that it's given us the ability to look back and say, okay, this, you got to listen to 50% of what you're hearing and knowing. And, and of all the people that should understand that sleep deprivation is not a badge of honor, it's our medical community. You know, right. we're going to make mistakes. We're going to get sicker and we're not going to, we're not going to perform at the top of our, of our, of our peak capabilities. And, you know, and that's who should be our, 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 our evangelicals for this, you know? Right. In fact, you know, I'm, I've trained so many years ago that back in the house before there were any time restrictions, and so we would work 36 hour shifts and just routinely and then go home, sleep and come back and do it over again. And when you think back at it, you would just, you know, an impossible, you know, task to put on people. And because the mistakes were made in the, you know, the eighties and there's some reports out in New York City that came up as they started putting time restrictions on how long, you know, residents or physicians in training could actually be up. And, and serving the public because they're you're going to function so long. And so you're exactly right. You know, we should have a better sense for 
if we impose restrictions on how long we can function, then people that because of innately because of their condition, they can control it. They can't say, okay, my shift's over, it's time to go to sleep now, and you go to sleep and wake up all refreshed, which would be wonderful if that would happen, but as you know, that's not the case for people with sleep disorders. You're still muted. So I wanted to give uh, Jill's the last word and sort of leave us with the call to action. And, and, and I know you have a question for Dr. Patterson. Uh, I know you've been listening intently, taking this all in. Um, so I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on where we go next, because I think we could have this conversation for hours. And I look forward to having many more of them. I think it'll be a, a really good thing that we should do for our communities. Well, I, I do think it'd be great if, if we could, like, you know, just said, you know, to have some sort of virtual meetings where you could pull things together. Unfortunately, I said, you know, to try and bring physicians in on things, you know, we're, it's like herding cats to get physicians to do anything because we've been, you know, the, the boss of our lives for so many years and, and control of things and try and change the models. So they would like, you know, any sort of convention to get to meet people that you've known in the past and communicate with people and a lot of face-to-face -face things is so helpful. And the idea is sitting behind a computer screen and remember to look at the camera and not at the picture of the person and that, that sort of thing can be so difficult to do sometimes. Um, but, you know, it, but like I said, hopefully this you know, COVID situation has encouraged people to be more comfortable doing Zoom meetings, doing this sort of meetings and, and virtual conferences. So absolutely, it's an easy way to pull people from around the world, and pull people from so many different specialties and, and backgrounds in one venue. I think it'd be great to do that. So I highly encourage any way the organization can do to accomplish that. It'd be wonderful. Uh, one last question, which is yes, kind of different. Since you are both a doctor and a caregiver of someone with a rare condition, uh, I'm coming back to the comment that Adam had about uh, HIPAA. I noticed in many of the cancer online communities that we build, for many of them are rare cancers, that people don't care so much about privacy. They always have to make, like, put in the balance, respecting, like, protecting your privacy against giving it away in order to get as much information as possible, since it is the same situation for the rare cancer, for most of the cancer, as it is with sleeping condition. Most doctors have very little uh, knowledge about those conditions and are of really limited uh, help. And so you, in order to get the best information you can, you have to give away your privacy in those online communities in order to get something back. Right. And that's exactly right. And, and uh, the HIPAA regulations, they are a significant burden on what we can do. If the patients choose to release information, that's perfectly fine. And you can talk about your conditions. Uh, some will worry about, you know, the, the kickback against them if they, comment, make a comment about something, and then it comes back to affect them in the future. Because when it goes online, it goes on media, then it's forever. And we're about employment interactions or employment issues or insurance um, situations that can be a problem from that standpoint. But we physicians cannot release any information or any patient-identifiable information. The patient can absolutely can release information. But you're exactly right. If everyone's very cryptic about conditions, what they're talking about, then it can be very, very limiting as far as what works. And that's why when my daughter was first diagnosed, I went to one of the, the meetings, the Narcops Network meetings, and actually it was a venue where I could talk to everyone. I could talk to the clinicians, talk to the patients, and figure out what worked best for them, and then come back and talk to her physician to try to implement some of those things. And you're right, you know, I sort of, one reason I pushed this for the Narcops community, because I am kind of in this weird position being both a, I, you know, you know, I said PhD in biochemistry, so I have the science background, I did research for a number of years, being a clinician and being the parent of someone with you know, a chronic condition. And so I sort of viewed that for whatever reason I was thrust into this, that I could sort of be as a conduit between all these different organizations, different groups, because a lot of times the patients can't understand with medical terminology and the clinicians don't want to hear from the patients because they, you know, for whatever reason. And I sort of act as the kind of the, the Rosetta Stone, as you were, to try and tie everything together and communicate across the different groups. Um, and I, that's one I, of the reasons I've been so active in doing things. I, I think, Dr. Patterson, that's a great way for us to end this. I think uh, you've been a, a hero and a role model 
uh, for the rare sleep disorder community and, and, and sharing your knowledge with, with our chronic condition is, is exactly what we need more pediatricians to cross over, more, more clinicians to cross over, not be worried about having that, that necessary patriarchal, uh, traditional academic conversation that, that was set up with the white coat. But, you know, sort of to move into this shared decision making, just like we work with our accountant, we work with our attorney, uh, that when you are well, that you can talk to your, 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 your health care provider about what's in your best interest. And, you know, when there's time for that, that person to be the, the boss in charge, you know, when you're on the table or whatever it is, they're in charge. You, you don't tell them how to do their job. <laughs> that's what they're trained. That's what you're trained for. So, <laughs> we want input from the patient as well, obviously. Of course, you want to know if it's going good, if it's going bad, or in- indifferent, right? <laughs> so, I just want to leave this call to action out to all our all our community, to anyone that's listening, uh, that's that's worried at home with their loved ones, uh, if they're a patient themselves. The best thing and the, the most important thing that we could all do is stay at home right now. Uh, do not go out unless you're a first responder. Do not go out unless you need food. And if you go out and need to get your food, take all the precautions in the world. There's nothing too, too, too over the top at this point. You might look silly, but it's going to become the new normal. We all need to look, start wearing our bandanas. We're all going to the Wild West. And, <laughs> and we got to learn to stop touching our faces because it's not necessary whether this is an aerosol disease. We know it's, it's, it's hand, foot, and mouth. And we know that you know, no matter who you are, if you're, you're smoking, you're vaping, you're putting your fingers in your mouth and if they touch something, you know, you're, you're playing roulette right now. And, you know, right. I just, just want to really make sure we hammer that home. Uh, we don't know the ins or outs about CPAP and, and the benefits. If you have the virus, we're going to learn all that stuff a, as we go here. Uh, but we'll, what we do know is, is you want to do everything in your poss- possibility to survive and thrive. And that means staying home is the best and only thing that all of us should be doing. All right. Yeah. Sounds good. Everyone stay safe. Wash your hands. Stay home. Okay. Wash your hands with chlorine, too. <laughs> or even soap and water work fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little over the top. Thank, okay. thank you guys so much. Uh, we will talk uh, hopefully soon, Dr. Patterson, and uh, I look forward to having many more of these conversations down the road. Stay safe. Adam, yes. While you were giving your call to action, stay yes. home, stay home, and stay home. Yeah. The governor of Florida finally two and a half weeks too late has issued a like shelter in place for the entire state. Hallelujah. Finally. The Finally. banana republic is coming around. <laughs> <laughs> what we are. Right. Thank you, Dr. Patterson. You're Thank welcome. you, Dr. Patterson. Appreciate talking have a, to everybody. Have a good day, everybody, and, and we'll see you next time. And I, I think with a behind the mask with Mark and Adam could be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> I like a lot. Yeah, have a good one. Likewise. Likewise.